Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Matt Skinner. And me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Rolf Jacobson. And me, Caroline Lewis. We are coming up on October 25th, which is the 21st Sunday after Pentecost. We also have a Reformation Sunday podcast, which is also October 25th. So if you're into that, uh, find that on our website. But if you're doing these readings, they are Leviticus 19, 1 through 2 and 15 through 18. Or the semi-continuous first reading is Deuteronomy 34, 1 through 12. Psalm 1, easy to remember. 1 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 8. And the gospel text is Matthew 22, 34 through 46. Ay, ay, ay. Fun passage. First half's easy. Second half is like, what? So, what are you going to do with that text? What are you going to do with that gospel text? Well, first of all, again, I've been harping on this the last three weeks. Uh, Jesus is in the final week of his life. He's come to the temple, and all these different groups of Jews have come up. Now, they've skipped the, the Sadducees. Uh, so, uh, in this cycle, in Matthew, they've skipped the Sadducees' question. You might want to add it, but, but you need to know it, because it says, when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, then one of them, a lawyer, asks, uh, which is the greatest commandment? So this is sort of the last of the texts, or the tests of these different groups that are coming to check out Jesus um, and, and, and figure out who he is. Um, let's talk about the first half, then the second half. Um, the first half is really common knowledge. There's nothing fancy to this, right? I mean, you know, uh, what's the greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. Yep. <laughs> right? Yeah, he's not the first Jewish teacher who has uh, said this. this one. So it puts him right in the heart of Jewish biblical interpretation. What's odd is that there's no, like in Mark, where Jesus says, you know, the scribe says, you've answered well, and Jesus says, you're not far from the kingdom. Matthew, <laughs> Matthew doesn't want to have a good scribe. Well, so Matthew, it just the conversation just turns. In in Mark, Jesus then Jesus himself escalates the conflict by what he does next, and he sort of does it here too, right? So he's finished this, he finished this, and then he turns it to being about the Messiah. Yeah, now he has quite. He's like, you guys are all done, so now I got some questions for you, and so. And. And again, it's in this context of, you know, a asking a question to test him. Uh, and, uh, you know, and here, well, particularly with this first uh, portion of the passage, obviously, the Leviticus uh, pairing is because Jesus quotes a Leviticus 19, 18, uh, in verse 39, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And uh, our colleague, Kathleen Schifferdicker, has a... Um, a commentary on, you know, on, um, it was funny, like, I never realized I could fall asleep on a treadmill until I did so while trying to read Leviticus. Uh, so I'm not necessarily uh, inviting people to read the entirety of Leviticus, but I would read 19, chapter 19, the entirety of chapter 19. And how is it that you, we can imagine this is a backdrop for what Jesus is getting at in terms of of this of life of of life of holiness um, and a, and a life that uh, of 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 that expresses relationship with God. What is the what is the greatest you know what is the greatest commandment? Yes, loving uh, loving the Lord your God, but it's also loving your neighbor. And so that this that the mark of holiness of the community um, is is. It is marked by this particular commandment, and so I um, not that I would you have to preach on Leviticus 19, but I think it's I think it would be helpful to uh, helpful for people to make those kinds of connections uh, that you know that Jesus is not just randomly coming up with something. Oh, love your neighbor as yourself. That sounds like a good thing to say. I love the continuity that this points out, that this isn't a new idea that came along 2,000 years ago, but this has always been God's expectation of God's people in the world. Um, it, it, it is what the commandments are calling for. 
And now I'm going to get in trouble in asking at what point do we preach into this moment, this call for this kind of love of neighbor? I mean, the, uh, I, I didn't respond earlier as we were talking about the front end of Matthew because I'm all over what Caroline just did to pull it through what Leviticus is saying. Um, you shall not render unjust judgment. I mean, what are the protests about? Um, you shall not go around slant as a slanderer among your people. What is your Twitter feed read like? What is, what is your Facebook status sound like? How do you respond to people's posts? Um, you shall not profit by the blood of your neighbor. Oh my goodness, I can get in so much trouble preaching from Leviticus. So maybe you're right. Maybe we shouldn't preach it. But in the moment we're living in right now, how can we use an a easy clip? Love your neighbor if we aren't clearly delineating what does that really mean if we are a biblical people? You shall not let your cattle breed with a different kind. I think that preaches. Okay, maybe not. Where do you, it's 19, sorry. <laughs> where do you go with that, Joy? I mean, I, I'm saying amen to everything you just said, but um, clearly just pointing people to the text isn't enough. Yeah, okay. <laughs> we, would have, yeah. we would have figured this out by now. I mean, do we go with the um, way in which Jesus himself embodies this? Because um, clearly we all say we love our neighbor, but <laughs> we haven't put that into action. So in the weeks coming up to this, the variety of texts that we uh, have looked at have talked about who the different people are that are extended this invitation to be brought to the feast, to the provisions of, of God. Um, we've, um, we've named the reality of those who are oppressed, who are poor, who are outsiders that are actually invited to the table. And um, here, if we were to start naming, and again, I'm going to do this in terms of our contemporary reality, unjust judgment. Um, uh, gosh, I'm going to get in trouble for this one. Um, but, you know, we judge uh, the, per the, the police officer who makes a good shoot differently than we do the unarmed Black person that is dead. We find everything that can say this person was a threat and we ignore the fact that there has to be a couple of bad police officers. I'm not saying they're all bad, but there's some that are unjust. We can't name that. Um, uh, unjust judgment. Um, um, go around slandering. I think I was specific about that. Uh, and and uh, the blood, the um, profiting by the blood of your neighbor. For me, I read that on, on the question of immigration. Um, uh, but also, gosh, I'm really going to get in trouble for this one. Um, during COVID, where people are losing their lives, people are losing their jobs, people are losing their homes, who's profiting from this? You know, the 1% are doing very well, well right now. I'm sorry. I'm going to stop because you're getting me all riled up and I'm going to start preaching and stop commentating. I haven't asked you to stop. <laughs> no, I think, but I think that it's, yeah, and, and, a, and a preacher should be able to find all sorts of contemporary analogs to this. I, Just, I bring it back home. Uh, keep going. I I'm skipping over the I am the Lord because at the end of the day, that is where I read the second half of Matthew. Um, uh, Ralph, you asked us to take part one, part two, and we really didn't follow up with Jesus's question. And, and who is the Messiah? Who is the Lord? Who is the Lord's anointed? So if I skip over that and keep going uh, to 17, I, I stopped being political, but I'm just as uh, convicted. You shall not hate in your heart anyone of your kin. Whether that is kinship of, um, in the family of God, there are Democrats and Republicans, um, or kinfolk, 
I have an issue with my spouse, my child, my brother, my sister, my cousin. Either way, we're not to hate. I mean, that, that, that's part of the loving the neighbor text uh, there. Um, you shall not reprove your neighbor or you will incur guilt yourself. I don't know. I think this is pretty clear. And I think, as you said, Matt, preachers should be able to find a way to talk about that in this context here. Wait, I think, I think you slightly misspoke, or maybe I misheard you, about reproving the neighbor. You shall reprove your you neighbor. You shall reprove your neighbor. You shall reprove your neighbor, or you shall, or you will incur guilt. Yeah, that is, you must yes. be part of some sort of community of mutual accountability. That's right. I mean, to me, well, um, we're spending more time talking about Leviticus 19, which is a lot of fun. I would point everybody to Catherine's uh, commentary on the website, just because I think it's the best thousand word introduction to Leviticus I've ever read. And it's just great, uh, just for to, the metaphor of, uh, of what Leviticus is trying to do and the holiness code is trying to do uh, with it. Um, Are we part of big enough communities accountability where, where we are not just mutually reinforcing a narrow story? That's, I guess, the, to me, uh, the damning question, because I don't think I am. If, if we tie it back to what you've been reminding us of, Ralph, for the last few weeks, all of the little communities have gone after Jesus unsuccessfully. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Herodians, the scribes, every last one of them. And so your question now, I think, is key. Are we part of a big enough, a broad enough community to actually be held accountable for being the people of God? And I think this is where, I, I think maybe this is one place where you can make a connection to the latter part of the, the pericope for the day, uh, for the Sunday, not that you necessarily have to connect them, but that, that question of what do you think of the Messiah, whose son is he? They said to him, the son of David, uh, that's how this gospel all began. <laughs> Uh, it, you know, it's uh, an account of the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And so that recognition of Jesus' identity uh, is, it, it, it really can't be separate, really can't be separated out from the kind of community that we're talking about. And so that's, you know, that's one of the things that such an, as we get to the close of Matthew here, uh, pretty soon, I am, that, how is it that you as a preacher are going to maybe tend to some of those larger themes in Matthew that we've been talking about and the distinctiveness of that, of that, of that, that gospel. And then, and that here, that identity of who Jesus is and that continuity of who Jesus is of, uh, of this is not, you know, the son of the son of David, uh, the, um, the son of Abraham uh, is, is, is that continuity then back to Leviticus and what that community then is called to look like? So that could, that, that could be one way you can make some connections. The, the, the logic of uh, Jesus, uh, uh, scriptural exegesis there is the logic of first century uh, Jewish exegesis. I think Matt and Caroline and I all probably had the same teacher that taught us how, how this works, Don Jewell especially his book, Messianic Exegesis, it's sort of a dad joke is the best way I could kind of get at it, right? Which is, because he's saying is, uh, uh, whose son is he? The son of David. Well, how is it that David, by the spirit, calls him Lord? He says, sit at my right hand. You know, if David calls him the Lord, how can he be his son, right? Ah, it's a dad joke, right? Um, for modern interpreters that haven't been introduced to that logic, it's like the congregation. Uh, I don't, wouldn't spend any time on that other to say it's sort of, you know, that's just how they, how this, the argument worked. 
Yeah, we expect this, since this is the last conversation, right? After this, they don't want to talk to him anymore. He'll have a few more things to say, but but for the most part, they're done bringing questions. You, we'd expect a bigger closing act. And this is just kind of a, ah, look at that. You don't really know what's going on, do you? From your own scriptures. Um, so it's, yeah, you don't want to spend too much time on it. But I like, I think explaining it as a dad joke is pretty brilliant. That it's, I think, <laughs> to go too far and to try to see this as a proof or a kind of apologetic move is, is, is the wrong direction to go. But there is something here where, again, he is talking to, he's, he's in the big leagues. He's the little country guy who has apparently stumbled into the temple and has taken on the, the top religious experts. And he's embarrassing them in full view of the crowd and everybody's loving it. So they kill him. Sorry to ruin the ending, but. But then God raises him. To just... that's, that's part of it too. That's, Spoiler. Now, well, now why no one's coming back next Sunday now. <laughs> Good thing this isn't the Easter season. Exactly. So, one just one comment before we move on about the law in Leviticus 19. The 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 perfect law, the perfect set of the perfect constitution with the perfect bill of rights um without a, because every human being is broken, fallen a sinner you can give the perfect instructions to an imperfect builder and not get the right thing out. And that's the problem with the law is uh, the human will is can corrupt any law, can misuse any law, can, can even try to do it right sometimes and just get it wrong. That's the problem in the end with the law. I mean, uh, the Soviet Union had a great set of Bill of Rights, uh, you know, um, maybe, maybe better than the U.S. Constitution, but they had no system of legitimate accountability. And so, you know, we just have to recognize in the end that we are the problem with the law. Ralph, where you um, talked about the context of understanding um, the, the dad joke uh, in, 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 uh, at the end of the gospel, um, at which also, if, if we point it out, is a missing of their reading of who is the Messiah. That's part of the problem with our reading of Leviticus or even our reading of the Ten Commandments is because we are reading it as uh, a familiar Sunday school advice as opposed to this is a way of living in freedom. I said this a few weeks ago in, in reference to Exodus which is countercultural to what the empire, the Egyptian world view and practices were. And so if, if we recognize that this call to how to live is in direct opposite to how empire works, then it, become, it, it has that same punch for us today as the Levitical code would have had for ancient Israel. Maybe we should move on to semi-continuous. Book of Deuteronomy summed up nicely in 12 verses here. Moses what a crime. <laughs> Moses dies, don't look for his grave, we don't know where it is. Hey, here's Joshua. It's, okay, yeah. Uh, um, so why? Just why? Okay. Semi-continuous, right? Moving here in the year A, trying to get through the Pentateuch, skipping from Exodus 33 to Deuteronomy 34. I don't know. Somebody uh, needed to be sent back for a redo on this. I mean, you know, why not have the love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind? You know, uh, uh, would be kind of nice. But... Uh, working with uh, what we've been given, I, um, it seems to me that the story and the way it's affected our culture here might be the moment, which is so Moses uh, gets to look into the promised land, but he doesn't get to go. He gets to give the long goodbye speech. And of course, in our culture, uh, you know, Martin Luther King Jr.'s last ser uh, sermon the night before he was assassinated was on that text. 
and um, you know, coming up on an election uh, in a couple in what seven nine days after this particular Sunday, that it just might be that connection and the idea that the promised land is out there and God will see us through to it. Um, that might be enough. I think so. And especially again, given the context where, um, where death is all around us, where people are dying and losing family members alone, um, not able to say the goodbyes they want. People are putting off important medical procedures for all sorts of reasons. We're just experiencing death really differently in this culture and not in an equitable way, of course, right? So there's, so there's that. So here you have the death of somebody who's revered and he gets a little bit of a legacy at the very end. Then the story moves on. So there's, maybe there's a way in which we can, you could talk about the disappointment. That this is all we really get from Deuteronomy. And, and a figure like Moses gets a rather disappointing send off in the lectionary. Uh, just like we're surrounded by disappointing send offs, right? Memorial services are stacked up in churches that are waiting to be able to have more than 10 people present in them. And, um, and it's just going to be more, I fear. We've also got death um, coming up in, in First Thessalonians in a couple of weeks, if you're following that. So you've got some text coming up that might help you speak frankly, and all saints as well, speak frankly about death and our new, maybe not, it's not new, a renewed relationship to dying that is compounding grief and compounding pain right now in a lot of communities. And maybe commit your, I don't know, next couple of weeks to that. I appreciate that uh, recognition of the moment, uh, Matt, because this is the place where I'm always struck with the relevance of the lectionary on the day or, you know, for today, contemporary relevance of the lectionary. Who would have thought? And you've just done a br brilliant way of doing that. Um, an another piece, whenever there's a transition of leadership, I always like to have folks consider is the fact that until the promised land is reached, until the fulfillment, God will always have a witness. So we do move from the beloved Moses to jo Joshua, uh, that, that God is always going to have a witness. Well, and I think too, there, there's a great poignancy in this uh, that, that Moses gets to see the land but not cross into it. And um, I think that that could be another place to drop down into this text. Uh, that you know you were saying matt in terms of um dropping down into the the loneliness of death and and the kind of uh, okay moses died and you know they did the morning and moving on uh but then but maybe dropping down into that um i don't know that that uh that place of seeing what's possible but maybe not getting there or it's so hard to get there or um, how do we imagine what that promised land, land looks like? And, uh, and yeah, kind of sitting in that, that place of um, when will the fulfillment happen? And, but yet at the same time, also, also being uh, maybe encouraged or comforted by the Lord's words, this is the land of which I swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, saying, I will give it to your descendants. Uh, I have let you see it. And so, you know, going all the way back, of course, to Genesis and saying, this is the, this is the promise. I've kept my promise. Uh, you might not see uh, the entirety of, of what's possible or what's going to happen, but I will keep my promise. And so I think there's something, I think there's something there homiletically, pastorally, theologically that, that a preacher could work with. The psalm? We're number one. Psalm one. Psalm one. Easy to find. All the way back to the beginning. I know. It's such a great poem, isn't it? I love this poem. Uh, and I love that the, sal the, the Psalter starts off with an invitation. Uh, the invitation is to picture yourself as a tree. What's your favorite kind of tree? That was not a rhetorical question. Redwood. Yeah, California. Nice. Yep. 
That's mine too. What, maple or redwood? Redwood. Yeah, they're California people, Joy. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it's picture yourself as a tree that bears fruit and survives the tough seasons of life. You know, you're talking, Matt, about, uh, you know, the folks in the nursing home. Uh, my mom had a stroke in July and then we couldn't visit her. You know, um, you know uh, dad, dad, my dad, you know, they'd been married for 60 three years, couldn't, couldn't visit her. And it was, it was uh, miserable. Uh, and, but, uh, but she is that tree. She's been that tree uh, for me all my life. You know, uh, that, that tough old, uh, that tough old woman who could uh, bear fruit and survive the toughest of times. Why? Because her roots were sunk into the Torah of God. Torah meaning scripture, not law. Uh, and uh, I think that's a beautiful image for the life of faith, is to have our roots sunk so deeply into the living word of God that we are able to survive and bear fruit for others uh, in the worst times. You could do tree pose in yoga. <laughs> okay, hold on. And you got to imagine, care. you have to imagine, wow. like, yeah, and then, but then once you have your balance, then you can grow your branches. So. Rolf just bears his family pain and <laughs> Caroline tells him to do tree pose. <laughs> I, no, I, I, Caroline talks so that the camera's on you again. I like that. Yeah, be, be a tree. Yeah, so I'm just like trying to embody the tree thing, which I, I love that. I love what you said, Rolf. And I, I um, yeah, so people, yogis out there will know what I mean in terms of tree pose. But there's something very powerful about that pose. I'm serious. There's something extraordinarily powerful about that pose when you want to think about like, what is that, you know, digging your roots in and, um, and what is it that you, yeah, what is it that, what is it that you have to weather? And uh, yeah, there's a, so the way in which um, you can imagine that yoga could be a way. No, I, I totally am done with that because it's about embodying the word. Because what Psalm 1 is about is that, right? How do you embody the living word of God? And, and to tie it together with that physical posture, uh, man, I'm to I, I, I can't do the tree pose myself, but I could have somebody else do it. <laughs> I can't do it either. <laughs> it's hard. It's a hard pose, actually. You have to balance and it's, yeah. And uh, you can't always grow your branches. So Makes, it does make me glad that Psalm 1 didn't start off with a picture of a dog. <laughs> Because then we'd be doing downward dog. Downward dog. Yeah. And tree is better. Oh, tree. I like tree. Okay. And now we are on our uh, second of five in uh, First Thessalonians uh, 2, 1 through 8. So we talked about last week uh, the potential of moving through this, uh, this brief letter. Uh, the first, you know, the oldest writing that we have in the New Testament, um, I mentioned last week the... Uh, power and and you are the power of hope and then uh rolf you talked about you know the encouragement uh as to uh how this might this might the, the encouraging words of this passage might really land uh significantly in a significantly pastoral way uh for our people so that was we mentioned that last week so this is a second uh and what would you all lift out here in this particular passage you have the invitation again, right? Which we talked to just briefly last week. The commentary did more on that. Mm -hmm. And the, and the um, um, picking up again also on some of the themes that we've already talked about in, in uh, earlier passages, uh, or earlier texts for today, um, is in, in spite of the persecution, in this moment of persecution, and, and whether that is not being able to... Um, be with your, um, uh, to, to mourn your losses, um, whether they are person or personal. Um, in, in, in the midst of this persecution, um, we still receive the word with joy inspired by the Holy Spirit and that invitation to have hope and to be, um, I'm threading back, to be a, a, a glimpse of the presence of God, a witness to God's faithfulness, um, which becomes uh, the, the promise um, built on what God has done 
in raising Jesus from the dead. And that gets expressed in, in not a gospel about speaking, but in a tenderness and intimacy that, that Paul describes with the, the, the image of a nurse caring for her own children. Uh, and here we're talking about probably an enslaved person who was a wet nurse whose job was to nourish and to raise the children of the household. Um, and Paul's saying that same kind of selflessness, but with one's own children. And then Paul talks about uh, Paul, Silas, and Timothy, that they were, didn't want to share the gospel, but to share their very selves with the Thessalonians and to invite a congregation to imagining what that looks like. We're not just here because of a shared purpose or a shared mission or a shared endeavor, but we're sharing our very selves with one another. And how do you do that in a way that's open, always open to someone new coming in? Mm 